Welcome to the World Famous Adventurers Club. I'm Craig Carroll, member number 1230. Over the past 101 years, through wars, depressions, and pandemics, we have met nearly every Thursday. Every Thursday evening to celebrate those who venture far off the beaten path. It is in that spirit this evening that I introduce you to an amazing explorer who defines the spirit of adventure. Please welcome Ashley Borders. So thank you for coming today. Thank we're you really for having me. That. I'm totally stoked to be here. You and know? you're very stylish, by the way. I love it. Oh. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, look, there's there's a lot about your past I want to get into, but I, I really want to understand how it all began. And and as you know, my understanding is it all began around the age of nine years old. And maybe you can sort of fill in how did how did a nine year old end up in the Australian outback? Well. Um it all started nine years before that, but um, <laughs> my traveling started um, when I was nine. Um, I was fortunate enough to get kind of handed an opportunity um, and crazy enough as a young child to say, absolutely, I want to go. Um, my family was living in Australia, and my father was going um, on a a trip, an adventure, as you might say, he's a surgeon, to, with the Royal Flying Doctors out to um, the Central Outback. And my mother was supposed to go with him, and she freaked out the last minute and said, no way, what if uh, the plane crashes, or what there's some huge accident, and we die, then we have four orphans in Australia. And she didn't want to go, and I was like, it sounds dangerous, I'm, I'm in. She's like, so, send Ashley. Yeah, so a nine-year-old, I raised my hand, um, and got to go on one of the most um, eye-opening, thrilling things uh, that I had obviously ever done, and um, that I thought maybe cooler than most people would ever do in their life. You know, and I was not like the cool kid. Um, I wasn't the popular or have you know other things to offer at the table. I wasn't going to win any sort of popularity contest, and so I thought, what can I do to make myself something, you know, and so... Different. You wanted to different. differentiate yourself. Well, I wanted to find my space, mm -hmm. you know, and I think that's the goal in life, really, is to find the space that celebrates the individual. Um, and so after this trip, though, of after having to... We, it's like a... A, a Piper, I think, was the airplane that flies in, and um, you fly over the outback, and we had to fly at a low elevation because there were storms, so the plane's just like bumping around, people are puking, and I'm like, this is amazing. You love it. I'm loving it. I want to like hang outside the window. Um, is your dad like what, like, what did I create here? Like, what's going on? No, I mean, he obviously saw this in me from a young age, and I think it, it saw it and then wanted to cultivate it, knew that this was, these were the things that I loved, and that was, adventure was what kind of grew the confidence in me, kind of gave me a seat at the table. Um, so that was our first. What did you do out there? Like, wh wh what was your day like in the Australian outback treating uh, the Aborigines for surgical procedures? So um, during this trip, I didn't help with any of the medical stuff. I just kind of wandered around. And when I think about it, too, I think my dad just let me, my memories are just like walking around the village. Um, what could go wrong? Yeah, you're kind of, yeah, exactly what it's going to take. There's like more deadly things in Australia than the rest of the world combined. So what could go wrong with a nine-year-old wandering around the outback? Uh, I never thought about that, but obviously nothing did. So um, we just waited for him to finish his clinic, and then you fly back. Um, I didn't get it, it, so f furthering my adventures. So this was the one I was like, I want to do this the rest of my life. This is fascinating. So you came back and you trips. were totally enrolled. Totally enrolled. Okay. Um, and so he continued doing medical, you know, relief work around the world, and I would go along, and so traveled throughout um, Haiti several times, um, mainland China, uh, provinces in the South China Sea, Eastern Europe, Central America. Um, I mean, can I ask you, like, like, what was it like? It must have been a little bit of culture shock to go from a first world nation to a third world nation, Haiti being completely destitute and oppressed by the French for decades, centuries. I mean, what was it like being in, in a place like Haiti? It's, it seems like a much different place than the Australian outback. Well. Um, yeah, it is extremely, I think it's, a, it's the, the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere, so there's a, a, a huge difference, not just in socioeconomic status, but also in culture. Um, and so I, 
that's what I wanted to experience. So to me, it wasn't even a culture shock. It was an excitement mm -hmm. about everything is new. You know, everything you experience, you walk down the street, the food you eat, the, the people that you see, the clothing that they wear, the cars that they drive, everything is new. Mm -hmm. So this is this, it's almost like an innocence and experience that, um, I was a child doing this, but even, but so now I continue to want to do these things because I think we lose that sort of ability to experience things for the first time, the more we experience. And so, um, when, when I was younger, I just, I was, I loved it. The weirder, the crazier it was, the, the more dangerous I thought the situation was, um, it was something that excited my soul. So it wasn't ever a culture shock, I would say. It was more about a learning experience, and I, I wanted to, to hold on to every single moment. Um, that did did you share a moment? Like, was there like a Haitian voodoo ceremony or something that was so like outside of your norm that uh, you can share with us? Sure. Um, so there were several <laughs> very exciting um, experiences. We went to Haiti several different times um, over the course of several years. And I mean, there was a, one experience where we had to, uh, we were in this vehicle going a couple hours outside of Port-au-Prince to the, uh, a village. Um, I don't remember exactly which one at the time, but we came across a town that, that was was rioting. They had gotten upset about something that the police had done, and so they were Molotov cocktails throwing all over the place, or burning the police station, and we were right in the middle of it. And um, yeah, my dad was just kind of kind of got like a quick like you know one on one on how to survive a, you know a third world. Um, dangerous sort of coup situation, so. Um, and, and, and how does, like, what's the proper protocol for surviving a third world coup, blend just in. so I know? <laughs> get out of the get blend out of sight, blend That's in. easy for you to say in the middle of Haiti. And well, you know, that's when you learn quickly how to sort of, um, how to do that. And I think that I've used those skills my whole life instead of standing out and being, you know, oh, look at, you know, let's, she's a target or whatever. You, you have to learn to kind of navigate your way through um, culture, I mean, metaphorically and um, literally, but you know, I got to, while my dad was doing some of these medical clinics, I got to uh, build a bridge with rebar and like rudimentary cement, um, in this village. So they were doing medical care. And so I was working with a team building a bridge and I think I was 12 at the time. And then why, why were you building a bridge? Because there was other relief groups there okay. doing work. And so, um, I just said, okay, fine. You need a set of hands. Um, I'll do it. And in that, it didn't just teach me skills. And, and labor, um, it taught me the importance of infrastructure. Mm -hmm. You know, the importance of, we might take it for granted that there's a bridge that goes over this creek, you know, to get to our homes or our shops. But in building a, 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 a small structure that you take for granted, these people then had access to wa f food, fresh water, medical care, emergency services. Um, and so that was the first kind of eye-opening experience, I think, to me, where uh, gratitude really sinks in and the understanding of um, trying to promote infrastructure in places um, that need help. So you just don't go and hand a Band-Aid. You know, it's like long-term um, long investment into um, these communities is the only thing that's going to really change. Um, so you could make an impact. You could find that your your hands could actually make it. It could change the lives of those uh, those people. Is that correct? Yeah. Oh. So even through small things, you know, I got to assist my father um, in surgery several times. I mean, this is not like anesthesia or stuff, but it's with headlamps and plastic chairs out in a field somewhere. Um, and there was a few um, times that really I was like, this is this is crazy. And for me to go, this is crazy. We pretty, want to hear that. We want to hear the wack. crazy or the better. Um, so at one time there was a gentleman that had a, a big, and if I say this wrong, I apologize, but I believe it was a dermoid cyst um, on his neck. And um, I was there, I think, with just my headlamp holding some tools and stuff for my dad, but he cut it and it exploded all over us. And um, Lovely. Yeah, so, you know, if you imagine a dermoid cyst, it's got like teeth and hair and it smells great and it was huge and it had his whole life. Um, but, and I remember was, the first the rule was like, don't throw up in the surgical field, you know, so <laughs> I have to keep myself uh, together and, but you know, that changed the man's life. Well, how did it change his life? Well, he'd always been, um, 
shunned from society because he had this big thing on his neck. You can't find a wife. You can't find a job. People think that there's there's a lot of stigma behind um, disease in the developing world that people aren't educated on why does this happen. I mean, it could happen to anybody. We just have the ability to take care of it quickly because we have access to health care. But in countries where they don't have access to um, infrastructure or health care or basic human needs, really, uh, little things can cause long-term damage, mm -hmm. even something as, as aesthetic as a, a dermoid cyst. Um, there was uh, a gentleman that we saw who had um, severe um, facial elephantitis. And so um, I don't know, that's when you're, it's a swelling of the tissue and so your skin just kind of, it, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was a huge deformity. Um, and so I don't remember exactly what they were doing. I think just cleaning it. There's nothing you can do at that point. Um, but again, it's not something that's life-threatening. It's not something that um, had to be taken care of, but it, it, it changed his life. Whereas when he was a child, if he'd been able to have access to basic medical care, um, he would have probably had a job, been able to have a family, you know, been able to do things without that stigma that's associated with disease. Um, and so I used to keep these photos of, um, you know, these patients uh, in my study Bible in the pocket. Uh, so I'm sure if anyone picked that up and looked through it, they would uh, think I was, you know, <laughs> wonder about me a lot more than they already did. Um, but I, I kept them there as a reminder of, you know, uh, how much we should be thankful for on a daily basis um, and how lucky I was to be born into a developing world with a great family. Um, so I would just prize those those photos and um, keep it with me at all times. It became like a token. I had to take this, this study Bible and these photos with me everywhere I went because it came like a good log charm. I mean, like, I remember one time I was in India and the bus was like, you know, when they, they you'd kind of go on the cliff and it's just going to like topple over at any second, you know, if just like a little bit of dirt gives way and there's... So I would like carry it in my lap, and you know, um, I lost it. But um, how did you lose it? Do you know where you lost it? Yeah, because I was like trying to hitch a ride on someone's little Cessna out of um, Panama, and there wasn't enough room for me, so it was either my luggage or me, and so I just left the luggage and jumped on. And the luggage um, didn't make it back. Didn't make it back, and uh, I, you know, as, as a traveler. Somebody's running around with a first stall right now. And no, so 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 this is heels. this is the story I was going to say. It's like, as a, a young person, um, I started learning too that like traveling so much that the things I wanted to take with me were these like good luck charms, right? So I would have a whole suitcase full of. Uh, my little charms, my, even to the day, like I have necklaces. And rabbit's foot. Rabbit's foot, well, never had a rabbit's it's foot. It's not really right? lucky for the rabbit, I always think, but. Yeah, that's, that's a, there was, there's a, there's a saying behind that. Give me a second, I'll come back around, but. Um, your charms, your lucky charms. Yeah, um, just have all these little tokens of my travels that, that they comforted me and I wouldn't take any clothes. So I would literally go somewhere with like one or two outfits, um, and I, I came up, I eventually like came up with a really good plan for this. So go with one or two outfits, but have my suitcase full of like my blanket, 500 power bars, because you also end up in a lot of places, a lot of weird food, and you're a 16 year old girl. Um, Running yeah. around third world countries and in combat zones at times. Yeah. So um, travel with these, you know, trinkets and just one or two outfits, but it was great because once I got to the place, if you're wearing the same outfit for like five or six days in a row, you know, you start, smell a little funny and uh, you have like those mud stick sp spots that get stiff and your foot goes. So somebody would always give me a little bit of cash to go to the market to go shopping. So I learned this kind of give and go of, um, you know, I could get some, some good old fashioned American dollars, go into the market and uh, I was like a kid in a candy store, you know, like learning about um, all the fabrics and the, the ethnic clothing. And um, so <laughs> on all the trips, if you look at photos of me, I look like, you know, the kid that wears the band shirt to the band concert. No matter what country I was in, I was like in their garb um, that I had, you know, taken from. Is, is that, I'm somewhere. curious, where did you, you, you clearly have a fashion sense. Uh, where did you develop this fashion sense? That is why I told you that story. Mm -hmm. um, so that kind of spurred my interest in, in fashion and clothing and the way that people use clothing as a way to identify themselves in like an anthropological sense. Mm -hmm. um, 
And that started my first company, which I had a fashion company that I started in college, and it started out with a collection that um, and had been inspired during my time living uh, in Senegal. But that's a, another story, so. And was there ever a time, because it sounds like you went through some pretty gnarly experiences, but was there ever a time where you were really genuinely afraid? Like, I don't know if it was the riot in Haiti or some other time, but it, it, as a young person traveling in some very dicey areas, the South China Seas, whatever it was, was there ever a moment where you felt like, I might have bitten off more than I could chew here? Um, I, I need to think about that for a moment. but. I really don't think so. Uh, every experience to me I saw as a new opportunity to learn something about the world, learn about how to survive something, um, learn about just the way things are. And so it's a great lesson to learn, especially when you're working with, you know, like relief teams going places, um, that things are always going to go wrong. I mean, I don't even like to use the word wrong. I just like to see it as an opportunity to... Um, learn new ways of survival, and then it actually it made me feel more confident the crazier the situation was, or um, the, the more sort of survival skills I had to learn. Uh, I knew that when I came back to the United States and I was around my classmates who were worried about getting invited to birthday parties or, you know, like going out with boys, uh, that if there was like a survival competition going on or any sort of like zombie apocalypse popped up, I was going to win. I was going to survive. So obviously, and luckily that never happened. Um, but it did instill a really great sense of confidence in me. And um, so much so that I even stopped caring about the social scene back home and just wanted to travel with my dad. Um, and, you know, I was very fortunate enough to have a father who believed in this mission as well, in, in cultivating it in me, um, that he would stick his neck out with these organizations because they would say, you're not taking a 14-year-old girl, you know, from Savannah, Georgia to on this medical trip or wherever, this medical dignitary outing, you're crazy. And I would say, you know, he stood up for me and said, no, I think this is really important. And, um, you know, put his reputation on the line. So I also knew that there was rules I had to follow, that um, there was a, a huge responsibility on me to learn about culture, to learn about um, people's traditions, to learn about the way people lived their lives so that I would be able to navigate that with grace um, and be able to continue traveling. And, uh, you know, there's a, for an example, when uh, you're traveling with a lot of these medical groups, um, especially medical dignitaries in some of these countries, the way of thanking you, you know, this is what most people travel to places, is they kind of offer their most extreme cultural antidote, you know? So um, you go to dinner, you're gonna get sort of the craziest food that, um, not crazy, but to them it's delicacy, right? So I got banned from being a selective vegetarian. That was happen often. So we'd have to eat, you know, eyeballs, blood, live echinoderms, um, bugs, which are so bad if they're fried, but if they're steamed or boiled, it gets a little bit weird. Um, so wait a minute, you like them fried, but you don't like them steamed? Yeah, fried okay. bugs are fine. Right. Good to know. Yeah, you, your palate changes a lot when you're not offered a lot of options. Fry anything and it tastes good, I always say. Yeah, exactly. Uh, well, almost anything. Almost anything. So what's, the odd, <laughs> what's the oddest thing that you ate during the these your teen years? Uh, that's a good story. So, again, let's go back to. Um, I know that I have to uh, respect the culture. I've been given. You know, if you want to continue to to go on these trips, you need to kind of be an adult. You're an ambassador, right? Yes, I am. I have to be like the adults. So we're in China. And my dad, I'm sure he already knows what story I'm going to tell. And um, everyone's already gotten their meals. And my father's sitting across the table from me, and my food hasn't come yet. And I was like, I, I totally remember, because we ordered two, by the way. This was Were they hunting the monkey in the woods? <laughs> Close. So I can't read the menu, you know, so I just kind of, I'm like, that sounds great. Um, <laughs> and so I see my dad's eyes, so they're coming with the food behind me and I don't see it and I see his eyes in like oh my god and I see him look at me and I can't even look at him because I feel that glare you know every parent has that glare that you give your children when you're like you better behave <laughs> I got that glare I mean I like, it's, it's like see it to this day 
And so the plate comes and they put it in front of me. And you know how that moment sometimes you feel like your heart's just gonna like, like jump out of your chest? Like it's fried chihuahua or something. It is, I am not exaggerating. It is moving like this. Not like the wind blowing and like, ooh, your salad might be moving around, or like maybe the, someone knocked the table. It is literally moving right in front of my eyes. And again, I can't even look at my dad because I see that stare. So I was like, "You're like dig in." I was like, "All right, I gotta do this," and I did. Um, do, you, do you have to like stop it from moving? Like I never ate a moving you, you thing. You have to just quickly put it in your mouth to kind of like get you on the way in. Um, I still don't know what that was, and I have no desire to know what that was. Um, so, yeah, that was the weirdest thing that sort of uh, had to deal with. But, hey, yeah. what was it like? I'm just fascinated. Like, you go to these far-off places, right, that most people never even read about. Most people, you know, in your Georgia community or any community in America don't really read about. So what was it like going to these very extreme environments and then coming back to this very southern Georgia, right? You grew up in Savannah. Savannah, Savannah Georgia. Savannah, so it's very southern, very proper, very cotillion. Like, I can imagine this must have been a little, like, you really were an oddball. Um, yeah, thanks, Craig. <laughs> In a good way. You're amongst oddballs here. Yes, no, I was very much an oddball. Um, but I, I learned to embrace it. I knew that, like I said, that... I needed to find the place in the world that I could celebrate who I was. You know, um, there's this ancient Toltec wisdom of if you search for the freedom inside of you, you will find it, but it needs to be in the spot where love really exists, which is in honoring our divine. We're honoring the divine in us by honoring who we truly are. So being and living who you are, no matter what that is. And so that's who I was. I was the oddball. I was the one that enjoyed living my summers in Haiti and in huts and, you know, wearing dirty clothes for days at a time so I could score a couple American dollars to go to the market and get a tie-dyed, you know, moo-moo. Um, so I didn't really care anymore about going back home or being part of the social circles um, that I grew up in that were so highly valued by um, the other, my compatriots or whatnot. Um, so I actually left high school um, when I think I was 14, most prestigious school in the South. I peaced out. Um, and I know there's a lot of, you know, eyeballs rolled in the community. And I finished high school um, through a correspondence school so I could continue traveling. Um, and I finished high school at 15, got a full scholarship to college at 15, and started college at 16 um, at a very well-respected school uh, in the South. So you're Walter a smart ard oddball. No, I think I was just a hard worker. And they, the school probably saw, well, she's really weird. If she can, yeah, <laughs> she'll be a good student somehow. She'll do something interesting on campus. Um, so I think I was able to at least um, do something <laughs> a little bit different. And did you continue to travel during college or tell me about your college years? Yes, I did. Um, I uh, started my first fashion company while I was in school um, and I entered with a gentleman who did a lot of importing and exporting out of China. So he told me how to kind of navigate that field. Um, I studied abroad in Dakar, Senegal, um, which is a, again, a whole other story for another day. Um, and I was uh, 17 when I lived in 18 when I lived in Dakar, um, and I studied abroad in London. Uh, and again, I travel with my family in the summertime, going different places. So before we get into uh, sort of the Middle East and Dubai and, and uh, Oman, I'm interested, you know, I've heard several people refer to you as the female Indiana Jones, which I think is pretty adorable. Uh, but I'm curious, what do you think about that? Do you like that, that reference? Do you feel like you're that person? Because you seem very apropos. Uh, wow, thank you, Craig. That's um pretty awesome. I don't, I'm a little uh, taken aback by that. But um, to address that, that's awesome. And I, I, Indiana Jones is one of my heroes. And it's funny how, you know, I work in TV and film in Hollywood, um, how fictional characters can sort of um, inspire magic in our heart um, in such a strong way that people decide to do things their whole life to sort of imitate these characters. Um, I've always wanted to be Steve Zizou. I don't know if anyone knows 
Life Aquatic, but Steve Zizou or um, probably the weirdest Indiana. movie I ever watched. By the way, I watched it because you asked me to, but I was like, oh boy, she's an oddball for sure. <laughs> uh, you know, so in Indiana Jones, um, these were the heroes that I had growing up because um, they were kind of emulated who I wanted to be, and you don't just like sign up for a job to be Indiana Jones. You have to really do it. You have to be it. And it's helped me with my career, um, styling and art directing, knowing the fact that there are people who watch these movies, who look at individuals on TV and really um, do try to emulate them for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also allowed me to take my travels uh, and learn more about my own creative process by watching these movies and seeing Indiana Jones and... Um, saying, oh, okay, that's where the art director like, you know, picked up those ideas, and this is how maybe I can use it for this or that. And so it's definitely, it definitely changes your aesthetic, and I've learned that through movies like Indiana Jones when I traveled, trying to pick up um, ideas and inspiration for my own uh, aesthetic and design. I think it's great, by the way, uh, to be clear. I'm, I think it's an impressive thing, and I also think it's great for you to be an influencer to younger girls, because I think it's not a natural sort of um, trajectory, career trajectory, you know, for young women. I'm not sure that they're particularly drawn to anthropology and feel at home, and I think the more influencers they have like you, that they see, wow, this is somebody who's doing it, who's, you know, beautiful, intelligent, and also, you know, gets dirty and travels in these crazy third world environments and comes back, you know, a whole person. Well, like I was saying when I was growing up, <clears throat> I wasn't the cool kid. You know, I, I didn't um, aspire to normal things. I, I wanted to go dig in the dirt and, like I said, go to third world countries. And so I started. Uh, my heroes became, you know, um, scholars, doctors, uh, eccentric explorers, um, and I, there wasn't really anywhere. There's a few females um, that really were important to me. You know, Jane Goodall. Was, I just still to this day I find it fascinating. Um, there weren't a lot of females in this sort of realm of what I wanted to be. I remember there are a couple um, women that I met through um, my father because I got to go to all sorts of fascinating um, events with him and. <clears throat> who are the most beautiful, stylish scientists in the world. And to this day, I still see them, and that's kind of what inspired me. So I thought, what do I want to do when I grow up? And I'm still trying to do what I want to do when I grow up. But um, it's to be that, to fill that spot, you know, to be exactly what I want to be, to be feminine, to be, um, you can wear you know, Louboutins, but I can also go barefoot for days in Oman. You'll see there's photos of me, and it looks like it's one day. That's like seven or eight days I have the same outfit and barefoot, most of them. You know, you can do and be whatever it is that you want to be and create the hero. You got to believe in something in life. Something has to be something that inspires you, so why not believe in yourself? Why not be that inspiration? You know, why not create it in your own world? So... That's beautiful. So in 2006, you end up in Dubai. A great story. Tell us, because it's a big life change for you at that point. Um, yeah. So huge life change. Um, it's, a, it's a good example of just saying yes and going. Um, I had been working on my fashion line, working in Europe. I had a small child. And my father had moved to um, the United Arab Emirates and said one day, you know, why don't you come? visit, see what this is all about. And so I said, okay, you know, not even having any clue of what uh, I was going to be arriving into. And this is in 2006. So in, in which country, I'm sure? I'm sorry. United Arab Emirates. United Emirates. So Abu Dhabi yeah, yeah, in yeah. particular. Mm -hmm. um, Pretty remote at that point. Yeah, well, not yeah, so they're, they're, they're small coastal towns. Mm -hmm. They're not the big cities that they are now. They grew very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I arrive, and the plane comes in, and you get off the airplane, and immediately it was, again, that feeling of, I've never experienced any of this before. The way people smell, the way people dressed, you know, uh, the, the way people did things. They have a service that escorts you through the, you know, the, the customs and gives you tea and dates, and then you walk outside, and there's desert. There's not, it's just Bandage. desert. <laughs> um, and we drive, you know, an hour and a half, two hours to the desert, then we come upon these, this little village, but it wasn't. It was all these big, beautiful homes with camels, and it was wild. I never experienced anything like it. So um, I said, okay, well, 
this is an opportunity for me, um, if I want to do something, to be at the beginning of an international city. Mm -hmm. I thought, never again in my lifetime am I going to have the opportunity to be one of one of the first in a city that's growing, um, and that will be an international marketplace. You so, felt that. You could feel that it was happening. Well, I mean, Dubai had big plans, and they had the money to make it happen. Mm -hmm. So if nothing else, it was going to go somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so, and it was starting from a little pearl diving village. And it was, you know, it was more than that when I arrived, obviously, but not much. I mean, all the tall buildings you see now were not there. There was the Burj Al Arab, which is the sail looking hotel, the ski slope mall, um, and then the old section of uh, um, not high rises, but taller buildings on Sheikh Syed Road, um, if someone's familiar with the country. But so I decided, all right, what am I going to do to get to stay here? Find employment. There wasn't like a monsterjob.com or something, you know, to find a job. And, and, and let me just say, dad wasn't like allowing you to live off the fat of the land. He's like, no, no, you're going to no, get a he's, job. Yeah, he's always been, you got to get a job, take care of yourself. Um, do it, you know, that will... A little tough know. love for his daughter. Well, I, I, it's been great for me to have that, so it provides so much sort of um, initiative, mm -hmm. you know? Say, okay, I gotta do this. If this is what I want, I have to do this. So, there was no fashion. I was, that's what I was doing before. There was no fashion in Dubai at the time. People were still really mainly in um, traditional Sharia clothing, which is the abayas, kandoras, you know, um, and... So what do you do? So I said, okay, uh, I'll go get a job at BBC. Sounds I have good. an international relations background. I was like, maybe they need a stylist. You speak a couple of languages, right? Well, at the time, just French. I learned Arabic when I was okay. there. But um, I thought maybe they need someone to style their newscasters or whatever. So I go to Dubai. And I get to Media City, and I have all my resumes printed out. I'm like ready to go. Media City is like an area or a building. I don't know what Media City is. Sorry. So, so um, Dubai has like different sections. Mm -hmm. Okay. So Media City is like a a small area of um, where they have their media buildings. <laughs> um, so think about even they had to build the whole country. So the infrastructure is kind of like you know sailing city, Media City, international city. You know, so this is Media City, which has Al Jazeera, Reuters, B BBC, mm -hmm. um, and other film production places. So I get there. I'm so excited. I'm going to do this. I'm like psyched up. And I'm standing outside, and there is no way that I can get into that building. Because you know, there's like security. two security guys with machine guns outside. There's all sorts of like passes. And remember, I'm in the Middle East too. Yeah. So I was like, oh man, uh, all right, all right. Let's think about this. So I'm standing outside on the cement. Um, just, what's the temperature? It's summer, so it's, so it's about 120, 120 degrees, yeah, 120, 115. Okay. It's hot. And you're wearing the Louis Vuittons or whatever they're called. So I do have on heels. Um, and standing there on the cement, and it was so hot that the glue on one of my heels melted, and the whole sole with the heel came off. Okay, Tragic. so and I tried to I tried to like get it back on there too. I was like, oh, it's still wet. That's how hot it was. Like it was still kind of tacky. So I was like jamming it back together, thinking like, you know, what would MacGyver do? Like safety pin it, paper clip it. it was nothing was happening. So. At this point, I'm like, Ashley, you just have to figure something out. So I had been noticing that there were um, several groups of, they all seemed to be Asian, I don't know why, but um, tourists or business people, I don't know, going in these groups, and there were several of them that day, and they would, they would walk around the corner and then just kind of go in the building, and I thought, Okay, like if I'm gonna do this, I gotta do this now. I'm already missing one part of my shoe. Because so, you would fit in so naturally with a bunch of short Asian people. Like, you know, who's gonna see that? Well, at the time, Craig, I was trying to, I was trying to come up with anything. Um, so, I'm um, now remember one shoe works, the other shoe I'm kind of like hobbling. So I'm like on my tippy toes, trying to make it look, you know, even more like I don't completely stand out like a sore thumb. Um, and so I do, I just kind of walk into this group and I'm walking and again, my, it's had like tachycardia. I'm just like, oh my God, I'm gonna have a heart attack. Um, and I, they, I get in 
no one says anything, you know, because if you just, I, I realize too now, after all these years of traveling on my own, just look like you know what you're doing. A lot of times no one's going to stop you, you know, so then you, if they do, then you, you know, definitely ask for forgiveness, not permission. So. I was in that mindset. I was like, I'm just going to go and act like I know what I'm doing. And I think they're probably now looking back on it. We're just like, who is this person? She obviously must supposed to be here. She's not just like hanging out. So I go in with the group um, and they kind of shovel us onto the elevator. And I know I can't for one second act like I don't know what I'm doing. Cause then there's another guard with a machine gun inside the elevator. So uh, I had to just make quick decisions. So I, I scanned the, you know, on the side of the elevator buttons, it has different companies and businesses, and I see BBC, and I'm like, oh, sweet, got this. So I push the button on the elevator for BBC, doors open, I'm the only one that gets out. And there's two more guards standing there, and I was like, oh, but nothing on my face. You know, great acting um, lessons then. And so I just smile at the guy and, like, go into the first office that's on my left. And I was like, this is just going to have to work. Um, and so I had I read on the door, you know, something production company. And it's at Macmillan Adam production or whatever. So I walk in and there's a gentleman standing behind the desk. And at this point, I feel like I'm just going to pass out. <laughs> My adrenaline's running. I, I think I'm going to go to jail. Uh, You're probably not drinking water either. I mean, you probably, you know, don't have enough probably water. Probably not. I wasn't, that's, I didn't even get that far, Craig. So <laughs> I was just trying to stay alive at that point. Um, and... Uh, the gentleman was standing there behind the desk, um, and I said, you know, hello, I'm Ashley Borders, I'm looking for you know, a job, an American, blah, 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 do the whole spiel. And he just, he just looks at me like, <sighs> so annoyed. Um, and so I handed my resume, still trying to, you know, be polite and Southern and sweet and not seem terrified. Um, and he said, okay, fine, you know, I'll give it to somebody in our office, you know, see you later. So I was like, I'm going home. I'm like, I'm out. Like, You've had enough. Fun. I've had enough. Um, You're hobbling out. I'm hobbling. I don't even have half a shoe. I'm, I probably smell bad because I'm sweating so much. And I have a silk dress on. And um, so I get almost all the way back to my car, and my Dubai cell phone rings. And I, was, I thought maybe it was my dad or somebody checking on me to make sure I was alive. And um, I answer it, and the gentleman goes, you know, hello, is this? My name's Sarah. So is this Sarah? And I said, you know, yes, sir. And he said, this is Hamish Adam. Um, I just met you. You came into my office. I'm the owner of this company. It's, you know, Macmillan Adam is the film production company. He said, uh, you know, how, how the hell did you get in here? And then I told him, and he goes, that's the ballsiest thing I've ever heard. And he said, in your shoe? Did I really see it? And I, he said, your shoe, you don't have a shoe. And I was like, you know, no, sir. And I told him the thing, and he goes, that's what I thought. And he said, would you like to come and interview right now? And so I said, okay. So I go back in All there. All sweaty with no yeah. shoe. And well, now I'm feeling a little bit more confident. But this time the I'm guards like, let you in, right? Because right? right? you had some secrets. Yes, so he yeah. called them down and gave me a pass. So I go in, and then he's got the whole company, like, in a U shape there in the conference room. And they're just, like, firing at me questions. And I was, now I'm pumped. Now I'm like, I got this. I got this. I got the job. So they hired me as their business, de business development manager. Um, and so it was a great experience at the time because I had to learn how to do business, you know, multi-million dollar deals with, uh, Dubai is 80% foreign, 20% local. So you have to deal with the Chinese, the Russians, the South Africans, uh, Europeans, Italians, you name it. Um, so it was a really great learning experience for me business-wise, also to learn cultural practices as a, as a woman in the Middle East and just... Every culture has different practices with business. Um, but in that time, I knew that I didn't want to do that forever. I made friends with the directors that were shooting our corporate videos or TV commercials, and um, they found out that I do design work. And so I started getting hired um, as uh, art director. Um, it's a long story, the costume designer, there was only like one other in the town, and she was like super territorial, so they're like, you don't want to deal with her. She's Iranian. She's crazy. Be an art director. So I was like, okay. Um, so, hey, before we get into your time in Oman, I'm just curious if there's some takeaways for our audience of, you know, you sort of have an operational modus operandi of acting like you own the place and you belong there. And I think there's a valuable lesson in being uh, in uncomfortable situations but owning them. So maybe you can hmm. share some of your uh, obviously successful techniques. Well, um, 
again, I'm going to fall back on my good friends, the Toltecs, say that um, if you live in the past or if you live in the future, then you're only half living. So I believe in just being present. Um, and in that, I think the most growth actually occurs, if that makes sense, because we're forced to deal with the situations that are right in front of us, not focused on what happened yesterday or five years ago. I'm not focused on what might go wrong and happen in 20 minutes from now or two hours from now. I'm focused on exactly what's going on in this moment. And in that, a lot of confidence and courage is created because you're not you don't have the noise in your head of, of, oh, well, this went wrong once, or, oh, this might not go right. You're just doing what you feel is in line with where you're supposed to be. Um, so I try to live like that. And a lot of times it's been great, and sometimes it hasn't. <laughs> but um, I think part of the times it hasn't gone wrong, I don't see them as pitfalls or failures, I try to see it as, okay, that's a lesson that I was supposed to learn. Mm. You know, this is an opportunity for me to, to grab my boots, get back up and learn and be better, you know, learn from that and, and do better and be ready the next time. So the next time I'm in that situation, and I'm trying to be present, I don't flop. Um, so I think that's really the key is just trying to be in the moment, um, without the, the noise or, or the parasite of the fear that just eats at you so that you lose the courage to live fully, which is being in the present. If that makes sense, or did I just sound like a total whack job? No, you sounded made total sense. <laughs> okay. um, you talk about saying yes a lot, which I love, that you say you have rarely, if ever, said no to an adventure. So talk about, you know, I think there's a lot of challenge in saying yes to things. People are fearful about what might happen, and it's very typical for people to say, oh, that's too dangerous, I don't want to do that, I'm, I'm afraid of that. You are not that type of person. I'm just curious what, you know, how do you deal with these opportunities that come up that must seem pretty out there, like surfing in Costa Rica with the pro surfers. Um, like that was something you said yes to in the spur of the moment. It wasn't in the spur of the moment. It gave me a little bit of time, but pretty much. Um, so I think you can live your life one or two ways. You can be consumed by fear of what might go wrong. Mm -hmm or you can be inspired by what might go right. And everyone's given that choice. Everybody has that choice. So I choose what might go right, you know? Um, I don't think about the other stuff. <laughs> it doesn't always awesome. work out. <laughs> but um, again, life's not always okay, and that's also okay. It's part of the journey. It's part of the journey. It's part of the lessons. Um, so, so tell me, let's talk about Oman for a while. So you started working in Oman, which I got to say, when you first told me how much you traveled in Oman, I was really sort of shocked. And especially that you were in the south of Oman by the Yemeni border, which I've never been to. And I have an intrinsic fear just because of, you know, homeland security and all the terrorism. I just think, why would I want to go to southern Oman? But you have a different take on Oman as a country. So why don't we start with tell us about Oman? Okay. Uh, that's a good way to lead into it, actually, you're talking about the fear. Did you know that Oman has a global terrorism score of zero? Okay. Um, keep that in your brain for a second. But um, just a little bit of geography. Oman um, is there on the southeastern uh, section of the Arabian Peninsula. It's on the Gulf of Oman and the Arabian Sea. And if you can see by its like physical location, it's right in um, an area of, you know, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, it's so, a bit of a hot zone. Yeah, you can, you can call it that. I choose to not use that word. but. It's got a lot of activity all the time. So I think in the Western world, we like to always kind of focus on um, the instability and the tragedy of these Middle Eastern regions. But I want to take a moment, and not to get into politics, um, and celebrate the the really cool stuff that Oman has done and is, is doing. Um, it's the oldest running Arab nation. It's got a literacy rate of 92%. 
United States has 79 percent. How is that possible? The Omanis are better, uh, have better readers than the uh, Americans. That's well, um, a lot of it has to do with um, Sultan Qaboos, who was their leader for about 70 years. He passed away in 2020, but he is an unspoken hero of um, not just the Arab world, but I think the international world, especially in diplomacy. Um, he created a, an independent foreign policy for, for Oman, which made it like a Switzerland of the Middle East, so that if any sort of um, disruption occurred between uh, Saudi or Yemen or uh, Iran, Qatar, United Arab Emirates, that Oman was going to be completely neutral with all of these sort of situations. Um, you know, he made, built an incredible infrastructure in the country. There's great road systems. There's access to health care. There's clean water. You know, the people um, have access to education. Uh, they're not, it's not an opulent country like you find, you know, in some of the other Gulf nations. Um, but their, their basic needs are met. And they're happy. Um, and Sultan Qaboos has been an incredible individual in making this happen. He also um, was one of the first Arab leaders to not only allow but promote women in their um, foreign cabinet, cabinets. So there's many women that serve on their ministry. He appointed the first um, female diplomat to the United States, ambassador to the United States of America. Um, he built an opera house, first in the Middle East as well. Um, he created a lot of environmental and pollutant protection laws mm -hmm. um, for the country, which has um, which has saved their coastline and made incredible um, natural live reefs, which I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so, you know, not only is Sultan Qaboos a Renaissance leader who is uncelebrated in the Arab world, which I think he should be. Um, but, you know, he's an international diplomat when it comes to negotiations and treaties as well. Uh, in 2013, he secretly, I mean, without the public knowledge, um, Sultan Qaboos was the one that brokered our nuclear treaty between the U.S. and Iran completely without any news, without any sort of recognition. He was 100 percent responsible for um, United States and Iran's nuclear treaty in 2013. It actually went into action in 2015. But, I mean, that's a lot to be said for— um, Pretty progressive leader. Yeah, and a, and a sultan. I mean, um, so— Who's taking over now, by the way? Uh, thanks, Craig. I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. I definitely don't know. So you could say anything. Um, I, I know believe. that there was a couple—I mean, there was an issue because he hadn't named a successor, but there is someone in, um, running the country now. And is and it running they, uh, along his principles? Let me ask it that way. Is it to still continue along we'll the principles? We'll see. I mean, it takes—change takes time, mm -hmm. and implementing new um, systems take time. So, uh, you know— We'll see. But he's done a great job so far. Um, and anyway, I just wanted to take a moment and celebrate that part of the Middle East. And they have almost zero crime rate in the whole country. So, you know, people why say, that? why would I not want to go there? Well, why? I mean, it's, it's safer than walking outside this building in uh, five This minutes. building's not in a particularly safe neighborhood. I'm not sure if that's an easy grade. <laughs> it was I feel a lot easy. safer in Oman than in Lincoln Heights sometimes. But Yeah, that was an easy, um, you know, correlation to make. But. So tell me about some of your travels, and, and uh, t tell me about some of the expeditions you did in and around. I mean, it was around 15 years that you traveled in and around Oman, correct? Yeah, so it was um, in and out of the country. I mean, not I wasn't there for 15 years, but um, you know, I traveled extensively over a 15-year period, mm -hmm. and I started going there um, when my son was five, maybe four. Maybe it was four, um, and took him with me. I mean, we would just get in the car, and it's about a uh, two-and-a-half-hour drive to the border of town, um, which to, it's, it's great for getting your car fixed and stuff because everything's so much cheaper. Um, but then this to, is from the UAE you would From drive. Dubai. Dubai, me. okay. From the, from the UAE, from Alain, where my father lived, it's, you know, you can throw a rock. Um, so... Some stories. So one story that kind of talk is this is a good example of how um, the people kind of work and act in Oman is um, we were down there in uh, the southern region doing some, you know, off-roading. Um, that's it. Just some exploring in the in the car. And so you, as you know, anyone that goes off-road in a vehicle, there's going to be problems. Things are going to go. Ha not problems. One of my favorite things to <laughs> say in life is um, to quote Einstein. Um, and now I just kind of lost my, my train of thought, but um, 
No problem can be solved by the same consciousness that created it. We always must learn to see the world anew. So I kind of try to keep that in my mind all the time, um, knowing that things always kind of go wrong. So anyway, we're out, the car starts being really funny. Now we've driven a thousand miles through the empty quarter desert to get here, okay? So there's no like, AAA. Maybe no. the radiator doesn't work sort of thing. It's like, you gotta get this fixed. So the car had been overheating because um, we've been pushing a little bit too hard. So we go to the little section of town that has all the word mechanics are. And silly Americans forget it's Ramadan, the holy month of Ramadan. So everything is closed and nobody really wants to do work. So the idea of the inshallah mindset, which is rampant, really all the time, but especially during the holy month of Ramadan in a remote region of Oman, we finally find a gentleman who's open and um, say, hey, you know, can you fix this? Uh, He's like an atheist or something. No, he was not. So this is how the story goes. Um, he was just kind. And this is generally, the money people are just really sweet. And I think he felt sorry for us. He's like, because I didn't want to stick around for another 20 days while, you know, everyone finished their iftars and the holy month and, and then be able to leave. So, you know, we go to his home, which is behind the shop. We sit with his family. You know, and also it's like, it's a big um, lesson on patience because I'm like, my, I'm like, we got to go. Come on, guys, we're wasting our time. Like, we have to go. We can find another mechanic, whatever. Um, but we sit with them. And then eventually when it's iftar time, because they don't really move during the day. So the sun goes down. Great. Okay. We have our tea. We have our coffee. We have our dates. And he says, you know, well, and is in Arabic. Um, he talks talking about this Somali goat that he wants to give to his family for the next um, the next night's iftar dinner. And he's talking with my friend about it who speaks Arabic very, very well. And I just, Somali goat, Somali so excited about this goat. He's gotta go get the goat. And I went, I'll go get the goat. So that was the deal that I would go get this Somali goat, supposedly the meat's really better. Um, and they will fix the car. But remember it's in the middle of the night now because that's when they're awake working and doing things during the holy month of Ramadan is at night. So, so is there a goat shop down the street or? I don't know, Craig, I, I, I just kind of threw something out, but then I knew I had to do it. So yes. Did so you then, steal somebody's goat? Or like where does one get a goat in the middle of the night? I just started walking up and down the shops asking somebody if they had a Somali goat. And that's one of those things that, you know, I really think that one of the other shop owners probably took pity on me and took me to a friend's house and we went in the backyard and they had a Somali goat and I paid him a lot of money, I'm sure, uh, for whatever it was worth, but I didn't care. I just wanted the goat because it was going to make my mechanic happy. He could feed his family the next day for iftar, which, you know, they sacrificed them. So that poor goat, like the whole time I was walking with it, I was just loving on it. And I felt so bad knowing that I am walking it to its death. But that also means that I can now make it home a thousand miles through the empty quarter desert. Um, so, so if I you ever start looking like that at, at me, like we're on a trip, I'm going to be like, oh shit, she's throwing me under the bus. Like I'm going into white <laughs> slavery or something. Yeah. If you're like Sorry. really nice to me, you're like, oh, you're a really beautiful person, Greg. I'll be like, oh, it's coming. Yeah. I don't have anything to say about that. I was guilty as charged. Um, so. Okay. So you got your car fixed. He got his goat. You got your car. Yeah. I got him his beautiful goat. He was so happy. And to see... Uh, so a lot of times Arabic people are so animated and happy and he was just so excited but I knew that was a good thing because I knew then he too this was a holy goat now too so this goat was going to slaughter for his holy Ramadan meal that my car was going to be fixed there's like a whole psychology behind this are like, you going to get no, any of the goat you got to get a little piece of the goat a little goat to well, go I, we were leaving oh, okay I was out I want to go home so uh, I did know, I was like, all right, he's going to really fix my car right because he's going to be worried to be punished from God because, you know, he did a shoddy job or didn't fix it right. So, um, yeah, we made it home. And I don't know if you've ever even imagined what the empty quarter desert looks like, but driving a thousand miles through the Saudi empty quarter desert is like, have you seen the movie Mad Max? It's like Mad Max. With a four-year-old. Izzy was not with me on this trip, okay. but yes, he has gone that trip. Um, so you have to keep extra petrol in your vehicle, which is even more terrifying because it's, you're just in a, like a driving bomb, and because it must smell lovely in there. A hundred degrees, yeah. You got to keep and you got to keep the windows open because you get the petrol unless you have the gas tanks on the back. So one time we didn't have the. We learned to get the gas carriers on the back of yeah, your car. Yeah. Um, but the the sand is just like. I've never seen anything like it. it's just orange. You just see like a wall of orange and it's like encroaching on the highway. And I guess the only 
reason that you can see the middle of the highway, not even the sides, is the cars going by must push the sand off. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to really trust your uh, mechanic to make that trip home. And did he do a good job? I mean, I made it here, right. so I guess so. I want to make sure he's not getting punished by God or anything. No, we traded it in for a Toyota when we got back, because um, can't go wrong with a Toyota. Can, that's all you if can all the terrorists there. in the world use Toyotas, it's probably a good sign. That, that is it's a good that car. That is the only car for extreme regions. Yeah. So tell me some more stories about Oman. Like, you know, what, like what kind of things were you doing? I know you were shooting there a lot, but you also were vacationing yeah. there. Uh, so that's how I found the country was um, filming some spots um, for um, a couple hotels there outside of Muscat. But um, one of my favorite things to do in Oman is the total opposite up on the northeastern um, side of the country, um, outside of Muscat um, and on one of the barrier islands there, uh, Damaniyat Island, is to go snorkeling and scuba diving. Like I said, um, Sultan Qaboos put in some really incredible marine protection laws and pollutant laws for all the oil, imagine it's full of oil coming in and out of the Straits of Hormuz. Um, and also for the coastal construction to protect these reefs. So the reefs are alive. And um, they're a, a wonderful place in the summer months for whale sharks to come with their babies. And there's plenty of food all throughout the reefs. And it's a really protected environment, so there's no big waves. You know, it's just a very calm bay. A lot of times you can just swim from the shore um, out to your reef. And so one of my favorite uh, stories, I don't know if you guys are seeing photos, but um, is, swimming out uh, to one of the, I got up early, early in the morning, um, and this was, you know, near Muscat. I think I was at the dive center. Um, and I didn't have I didn't have scuba gear on, I just had a snorkel mask and squirt, and I was going out to the reef just to, like an early morning thing when all the fish are happy and alive and moving around, and I have on a wetsuit. And the swim out there is pretty far. Um, so you're just swimming, and you know what that stretch of, um, when you're scuba diving or snorkeling, and it's just the white rocky bottom in blue, so you kind of lose perception on what's around you and how deep it is, and it's just all the same thing. So I can see how people get lost sometimes out there. Um, and so I see the water is like different shades. You know sometimes um, it's like there's different pockets of temperature in the water or mm -hmm. salinity, and so it kind of looks like different viscoses. And so I see it around me, and I was like, oh, that's, that's weird, you know, and I just, don't even think, like, don't swim into it. I just swim into it. And then all of a sudden, it changes, and it starts matching my wetsuit. And I swim into a school of giant cuttlefish. They were, their biomimicry is so good that I didn't even see them, because they, that's what was moving was their bodies, but mm -hmm. they were imitating the color of the water and even the rockiness on the bottom. Um, I swam right into them and it was just a magical experience and they were just kind of checking me out and changing color and it was like psychedelic and I was not on any psychedelics. I was just, just straight up early in the morning swim. Um, but those are the kind of experiences that really um, excite my heart is to, a giant cuttlefish is about three feet, like a meter. So they're not that big, but that's a pretty big animal to be flashing and changing colors and matching your wetsuit. and. Um, so th that was an incredible diving opportunity, and um, I've dove with the whale sharks there. I have horrible underwater photography, so I did the best I could to find some photos. Um, I'm the one that gets too excited, and I don't even want to take pictures. I just want to like touch them and get up close. Um, I have one good picture of a an eel, but that's it. Um, and. Uh, it's just magical. Well, whale sharks are some of the most incredible creatures on the planet. They're so docile and majestic and just to be, you know, in their presence um, in, in a protected environment where they feel safe, you know, um, they, they're curious about you as well, um, they're not going to hurt you, they're baleen feeders, um, is really one of the most uh, awe-inspiring things I think we can do as a human is to be in the presence of these um, marine creatures that are ancient. It's a dinosaur. You know, and um, I got to be so close to them on several opportunities, and, and they sw they swim together in, in schools. Uh, I was going to say a, a, a group of sharks is a shiver, but it's not a shark; it's a whale. Never mind. So step is, back. Is the is the sea that your favorite part of Oman? Because I would never think of it as a diving destination, but maybe it is. Um, 
No, I mean, the sea is absolutely stunning in Oman, and that's such a, a beautiful part of the country. But let's just jump right back down to the south mm -hmm. and the Dofar region, um, which I wanted to go to in the beginning um, because it's the home of frankincense. The Boswalia tree is the, the tree that the resin for frankincense comes from. And I had read about it in books and heard about it, and I said, I want to see this place. Um, so it's at the very southern uh, tip on the border of Yemen. You can see Salala there. Um, and it's an ancient crossroads between North Africa, Asia, Europe, um, and the Middle East uh, for the frankincense trade. So there's a Kohrori, and there's some um, there's some like uh, ruins and excavation sites I have photos of. Um, Korori was the home of um, Subaran, which was a castle um, that Queen of Sheba occupied for a while. And um, it dates back, they, as archaeologists think, that it dates back to about 8th century BC, so wow. almost 3,000 years ago. Um, as a trading post, and so they found pieces from China, um, from Iran, from from England, from Europe, um, in this beautiful walled city that sits on this freshwater lagoon that is then flanked by these two. Um, like plateau style mountains, so you can see how it would just be the perfect place to either defend from, you know, w war, or also be a safe harbor for all these ships to come in. So it's it's literally stepping back in time, and it's just open. You can walk, you can dig. I pick up rocks, move things around. There's, it's amazing how there's no one there, just like you know, watching this site. Um, but, you know, Queen of Sheba became so obsessed with frankincense that she made her home there for a long time, and she was trading with King Solomon the frankincense, which kind of, um, that put her in the place in Jerusalem, was that relationship over the frankincense that came from Salala. Um, and it's just so rich in, in, in history, not just a beautiful place with interesting topography. And Salala has something called the Harif Festival, which is the rain, for, uh, rain festival, which happens in July. Okay, So the rest of the Middle East, the rest of this region is like 120 degrees. It's dry. It's miserable. Um, during the Harif Festival, uh, camel herders from all over the region come so that their camels can eat because it's rain and it's green and it's raining and it's a monsoon season. Um, it's really, really special and magical. So there's just camels everywhere and they're herding everywhere and just walking because they, they just let them go and so they're just everywhere. Um, so, you know, you have that very special lifeline too of this whole MENA region. Um, in in Kofrori and these ruins, and um, you can visit Job's grave there. And um, there's some ancient cities. I mean, they think that there's, they're not really sure um, about uh, some of these these recent cities they found. Um, let me ask you a question. I'm curious, and I just want to kind of segue for a second. So you're getting a graduate degree at Harvard in archaeology, anthropology, mm -hmm. and I'm curious about, uh, you know, being in a place that is so uh, uh, archaeologically important and also so uh, ignored by, you, you said there's no security around, you go to these sort of huts that are hundreds, maybe a couple thousand years old, there's relics everywhere. Like, I mean, that must be like a real amazing place for you. Oh, to me it's like a playground. Yeah. Um, I, I'm thrilled and fascinated and I just want to touch everything and I want to put it in my pockets. I probably shouldn't have said that. I don't want to put it in my pockets. I leave it all where it is. Um, <laughs> so. You know, a lot of um, the thing about archaeology and anthropology is, unless there's an institute that's got a lot of funding that's interested in what's going on, it just sits there. Nobody really cares. Um, this there's in in Shisher, which is about 70 kilometers on a dirt road outside of Salala, um, in the early 90s, some like archaeologists using LIDAR found um, what they think is the lost city of Ubar, which is is like the Atlantis of the Middle East. It's a huge discovery, and I went there, and it's just kind of half done. Just kind of, they, people ran out of money, and nobody cared anymore, and they just left it. Um, but you know, it was supposed to be like the Babylon, and it could be. Like, it, there's 30-foot towers that they've seen that the, the desert kind of has swallowed it into a sinkhole. Um, but to me, that's so exciting. Like, how cool is it that there, there's this history of this lost city of Atlantis um, for the, of the Middle East? It's maybe here. 
uh, just sitting in the middle of the desert getting swallowed. But you think under the building here there's something maybe? <laughs> the lost city of the Adventures Club? Who knows, Craig Carroll? Who knows? A couple of dead members that didn't pay their bills, maybe? He said it. I'm just saying. You, know, Rich you guys are looking for somebody. You just, you just ratted yourself out. So what other things do you like about Oman? Or, or how would you describe Oman to people who are thinking about going? Is it a place that, uh, like, do I go to the Club Med of Oman? Like, is it a place I could have an arranged travel experience? Or is it really, I'm just throwing myself into the, you know, the, uh, the, the netherworld and see what happens? Craig, Oman is a country of everything. No matter what you're looking for, maybe not snow, but you can find your mountaineering, you can find your fabulous resorts. Mm -hmm. The Chetty is one of my favorite hotels in the world, and it's in Muscat. Mm -hmm. I mean, you talk about five-star, anywhere else in the world doesn't even touch uh, five-star service of these places. Um, so you, whatever you want, you can get. But like I said, the people there are happy. They are extremely tolerant of um, Western religion and culture, and they're loving, and they're, they're friendly, and they're laid back. You know, that's something that you, you don't experience there is like there's no, there's no hustle and bustle. Um, and anybody wants to go there even with children. I've taken my son from when he was four till 15. Um, it's safe. You know, I would just go walking through villages and then they would, they would come outside and embrace me and bring me in and grab my little kid. And I was like, oh my God, they just grabbed my child. But like, they just wanted to be, they wanted to share with me and they didn't have much. Again, it's not, a, it's not a country of opulence unless you're at the Chetty. And yes, that is like the most opulent place. Um, but they, they're just, they're just really loving and friendly and whatever they have, they do want to share. And they wanted to learn more about me too. It wasn't just about me being fascinated by them. They were fascinated by who's this blonde that just parked in our little village and is walking around with, you know, a, a kid throwing his Thomas the Tank engines everywhere, you know? So, um, talk for a second about this, about, um, about how friendly the world really is. I mean, this is one of the things I'm always amazed. Wherever I've been around the world, I've been embraced on average, not by everybody. And I find that this is true, especially in a place like Oman, I would imagine that you're such an oddity and they're so interested. They want to absorb as much of your culture as possible. And they're going to offer you the best food and the best bed in the house and the best of everything, which is, you know, you come to my house, you're not getting the best. You're not getting my bed. That's for sure. You're sleeping in the guest bedroom. You know, you get a good steak, but I'm getting the better steak. So it's kind you of- You guys a are all friends with Craig and he treats you like this? <laughs> I'm just saying, you know, maybe I could learn something from the Omanis. I think we can all learn something from the Omanis. Mm. Um, have an open heart, open mind, um, and just be full of gratitude. So I think the most of the world is like that. Tell me some of the lessons you've learned traveling. I mean, you've been to dozens of countries. I have, do you know how many countries you've been to? No, I think I'm about 24, but every once in a while I look on the map, I'm like, oh yeah, it's not that one. Um, you know, for a while I had free flights. Uh, took, I took a part-time job at Dell so, so I could fly around the world. And so I would literally get on a plane Friday evening. I didn't even know where I was going. I would just fly to the airport and see where they had, which flights were open in first class so I could eat for free and have a few glasses of wine and then show up in some country somewhere and then fly home the next day after a couple hours. Um, this is like a great travel hack. I've heard some travel hacks, but this is the travel hack of the century. You should give them just a little context so you understand, like, this girl worked the system. It didn't yeah. the, the CEO of Delta call you at one point? Yeah, yeah. okay, let's... Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Cat's out um, of the bag now. So... Uh, yeah, so a friend of mine who's a film producer, he was just traveling all over the world, and I was like, you know, no offense to this guy, but he doesn't make this kind of money to be able to be doing this. And so I asked him, I was like, what's up? He's like, yeah, I work a couple hours a week throwing bags at Delta, and I got free flights. And I was like, oh my gosh, that's possible? Um, so I like ran to the airport pretty much and um, applied for this job, and they're so used to, I mean, the guys that worked with me were doctors, I had lawyers, film producers, a lot of policemen. Um, and I worked twice a week, five hour shifts from 4 a.m. till 9 a.m. loading airplanes and throwing bags um, so that I could go anywhere I wanted at any time. It was the best experience. And then I learned that I could actually, you only got paid $7 an hour. So a lot of the people I worked with actually that was their job. So I would pay them like 150 bucks plus the money they made from the shift, you know, to take my shifts for me. So I ended up like not ever having to work. 
Um, and they were all happy about it because it was just like, oh, well, no. Well, not everybody was happy about it. Well, no. Um, so hold on. Moving on. So, uh, yeah, I think, but that's the thing is travel is doable. Yeah. There's always ways to figure out how to do it, mm -hmm. you know? You just have to be flexible. Um, and I often travel with no luggage, even if I don't have someone to give me money to go, you know, buy some new clothes. Um, you know, I've done the Cannes Film Festival and a carry-on. There's, you know, there's, you learn that you don't really need that much stuff, you know? Um, what, what we need is the experience. You don't need to spend that much money. You don't need to stay in fancy hotels. You don't need to eat out. You know, I'll go buy a baguette and some cheese and throw it in my backpack, and that'll feed me for at least a couple hours. And your hundred, uh, your five hundred power bars, right? In my five, well, I don't do that. Sponsored by Power yeah. Bar. Yeah. <laughs> RX bars. Um, so. So, any other things about Oman that you want us to know before we sort of move on? Cause I mean, there's so many great stories. I just wanted to share a little bit um, about the magic that I, I've, a piece of it that I've experienced there. You know, I didn't even get into the wadis, and there's these natural oases that just kind of pop up um, in the mountains as you drive along. And there, I don't know if you've ever experienced a wadi, but it's a little jungle in the middle of this Mars-like terrain, and they're um, fed by natural springs, so they're, they're always, these deep water pools are always, you know, full, and it's really, really incredible. Um, and yeah, you can just imagine, I always imagine, like, I'm a, a Bedouin camel trader, and I'm going across the desert, and I haven't had water, and I'm really hungry, and then you, like, oh, you see this, like, palm trees, and dates, and water, and, um, so, you know, you have those everywhere and you can jump in them. I'm always grabbing people to go swimming with me in them and until um, I it developed a feel for, a fear for um, Nicolaria fallery. It's a brain-eating amoeba that you get in these little freshwater pools. Um, oh, nice. Yeah. Don't read too many science books, so. And do, do, do cities uh, revolve around these wadis? I mean, I would imagine that they're, you know, this becomes the water source for you know, a, a, an entire group, and they would build up their city yeah. around that. So the small little towns and villages are, usually, are around the, mm -hmm. the wadis usually because it's a, it's a lifeline. It's a source of um, the abilities for irrigation, mm -hmm. um, to feed their animals, to water them. Um, and it's just a lot easier to live with trees than on a desert, rocky landscape. How so. is the typical uh, Omani making a living? Like, what, what, is it agriculture? Is it trade? Is it? Um, I mean, I think historically, um, along the coastline is fishing, mm -hmm. um, and probably trade to Iran. But inside the country now, um, agriculture, selling Somali goats, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know. Um, and just your just typical, you know, you have shop owners. I, the, the biggest sort of production there would be in oil and gas mm -hmm. um, in the bigger cities. But uh, I think in the towns where I spend most of my time, it's just normal jobs. Um, I really don't know the answer to that, Craig. <laughs> Are there any uh, host jobs that I could get maybe? They're looking for a little, you know, gringo host to come in there that doesn't speak any Arabic and maybe cracks inappropriate jokes because I'd like to apply for that job. <laughs> So I want to leave Omani, uh, and as we start to sort of wrap this up, I think, um, how do I put this? As a, as a trailblazing woman, what advice would you give younger girls? Like, w w what lessons can you share uh, with younger people, anybody, people, but especially younger women who really, I think, need um, icons like you to, to follow? And I'm just curious if there's some lessons that you can, some wisdom you can impart. Wow, that's some... We're getting heavy. This is the heavy part of the interview. Yeah. Uh, I think I would definitely start with the fact that there is no normal. Mm -hmm. Normal does not exist. Um, we are all individuals, and our own basis for what we should be or shouldn't be is internal. Mm -hmm. So not try to fit in or feel like you have to do certain things to appease other people because then you're not living your life. You're just throwing away beautiful time that's given. Um, so to not worry about the status quo, you know, um, and, you know, say yes. Open the doors that everyone says don't open. I mean, unless it's someone's carry, but society says maybe don't do that. Try it. Nine out of ten times, the door you open is going to have the most beautiful view you've ever seen in your life. Mm. Um, the one time it doesn't, you know, you're going to fall right through it and it's going to hurt. Um, 
but that's part of life and taking chances is terrifying. Mm -hmm. You know, taking the path unpaved is rocky. It's bumpy. It's there's sinkholes, there's um, rock, walls to climb, walls to bust through, but you're gonna get the view that nobody on that paved highway gets. You know, you're gonna get the excitement of experiencing the animals around you and the trees and life. So it is difficult, but it's worth every second of it. Um, and, you know, I'd also say that, you know, to younger girls, eh, life's not always okay, but that's okay. You know, it's about just being strong and whatever that means. That means doing what you want. That means staying home and having a family, whatever it is, it's okay. You know, um, okay is just whatever it is, but it's not okay, it's still okay. And I think that's it. Is there something you say to yourself when you, uh, when, when the chips are down and you feel like, oh, this is bad? Is there like a saying or, or anything? Is there uh, like a, something you recite? Like I always think to myself, there's no problems in life, only opportunities to find a more creative solution. And when I get jammed up, I just think like, okay, what's my creative solution? So I don't know if you have the equivalent. I was just curious. I don't know. I think I've run them all out with you this evening. I so. think we got a lot of good data here. <laughs> all right. So if you don't, if you will uh, humor me, I'd like to play a game with you okay. as we wrap up today's interview. And we'll have a chance to ask some questions. But um, so we're going to play a game. And depending on how you answer this question, we, as the 100 year old Adventurers Club, 101 year old Adventurers Club, sorry, uh, people who know just a little about being a badass traveler, we are going to, um, we're going to officially decide whether you. You truly are Ashley Indiana Jones borders. All right. So I'm going to ask you a few questions. And, Do I get and like a monogram shirt afterwards? It's all coming to you. It's okay. behind door number three. So, okay. Can you speak any other languages? Uh, yes. I can speak two other languages just enough to be able to tell jokes. And so I think that's pretty good literacy. Uh, je parle français comme un vache espagnol. Humor. Nobody, really? Humor. Okay, that's fine. Uh, okay. Can you outrun an angry Borneo tribe? <laughs> uh, no, if anybody ever sees me running, they should probably run really fast too because I don't do it for fun. So you just have to be faster than me because then they can eat me and you can just tell the story at the Adventurers Club. Uh, okay, could you build a bridge in a third world country? Yes, okay, I've already, already done it with a, a lot of hands and maybe more quinine next time. Okay, this, is, this, is, um, this might be my favorite question because this is such a unique skill. Okay. Can you crack open a safe? Yes, it is my favorite party trick. And, and how is it that you just, you know, real quick, how did you develop uh, the ability to open safes? Or, or, I don't want to die if you have to tell me. I was going to say, anything. I really probably have to kill you if I tell okay. you, so let's so, move on. Let's move on. Uh, okay, how comfortable are you with weapons, and specifically machine guns, RPGs, and tanks? Hmm, okay, never driven a tank. If anybody has classes, totally sign up for it. But, you say yes to that. Yes, but I am from Georgia, so the others, absolutely. And I am a Annie Oakley uh, champion. I've won some tournaments, so yes. That's, I don't know. She's looking pretty good so far. Uh, can you scuba dive? Yes. Uh, advanced underwater, but um, I failed my cave diving uh, certification, and I'm just going to leave that back there in that cave, not going touching that with a 10-foot pole. Okay, okay. Can you ride a camel? Yes. Okay. There's a photo uh, up there somewhere. Here's a really important question. Could you judge a camel beauty contest? Yes. It is all about their eyes, their lashes, their lips, their neck has to be like the perfect girth, and the hump needs to be closer to the back. But it's getting a little if you, hot in here. Uh, if you, you describe them. inject too much or any Botox in your camel, you are disqualified. No Botox in the camel. No Botox in the camel. So there's a no the Botox rule in, 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 in camel pageantry. It's like a serious thing. Who knew? Yeah, very serious. Okay, can you hunt with a falcon? No, I can't. My brother Matthew uh, kept a falcon named Mordecai in my parents' living room, which was always kind of strange, but cool. Um, wait, wait, but I'd just like to point out that Mordecai is not really an Arabic name. My brother named him, I don't know. Okay. He, I think he's not Arabic. He's Was the bird in an Arabic environment, or was it in Georgia? The Arabic environment. Okay. Just seems a little like, I don't know about the Jewish name and the Arabic, <laughs> in any event. But it, I can skin a goat by inflation, uh, 
of a bamboo reed. What, is that, what does that involve? I've never skinned a goat, uh, mm -hmm. nor have I inflated a goat. You, you, you put a hole in the bottom of its leg and you take a bamboo reed and you have to blow really hard. After so it's the, dead. Yeah. So and then the that does what? Comes, uh, so that the skin comes off the muscle tissue a little bit and it's actually a good, it makes the meat a little bit easier to eat when you don't have like all the hair stuck. I'm sorry. I'd rather just buy it at the supermarket wrapped up in plastic <laughs> personally, but uh, can you restore an antique Mercedes? I am on my third Mercedes restoration. I wanted to drive it this evening, um, but it looked like it was going to rain. But yes, I do it all myself. Um, I'm in love with the 70s models, not diesel petrol <laughs> engines though. Uh, have you ever eaten monkey brains? No, but uh, came close one time. We were in um, Bulgaria with my father and uh, the United States weightlifting team, and we were at a restaurant, um, and they tried to offer us a live monkey for that exact purpose, and there was even the hole in the middle of the table with like the little... Um, to hold its skull. To hold its skull as they took its brain and opened it live. But we said no. We had pizza instead. <laughs> pizza story. with monkey brains. No, I think it was just plain old pizza. I'm pretty sure everyone said like vegetarian at that point. I think you're pretty credible, I gotta say. What do you think? Indiana? Yeah. <laughs> so I'd like to open up the floor for some questions of uh, the great uh, Ashley Indiana Jones uh, boarders. Does anybody have any questions she would like to? Ask the, the wild child here. You said there is everything in Oman, but is there surf in Oman? Yes. If you go um, close to where I was talking about with the uh, Demoniat Islands, there's um, mostly longboarding. There's a, a big kiteboarding community there. Um, it's huge. They have like tournaments, all the Red Bull stuff. Um, but I, I think you, there's a few beaches that do have a break, you know, kind of a, a short break for, you know, four or five foot swells, but really good longboarding up um, north of Muscat. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, the shelf goes out. It's like a slow, um, it's a slowly, it's a slow shelf out that way, so you get some really good breaks in different areas. Hi. Yes. So, hello. It, when you were in Dubai, um, did you have face covering, and how did you feel about that? And is that still there? I haven't been, but I understand that there is face covering at, at least. And, uh, do you mean like like for for health purposes or for Sharia clothing? Women are required, I believe in some parts of that area to wear a face covering. Is that the case with you when you were there? So um, the, the only country, to my knowledge, that requires um, abayas and face coverings would be Yemen and Saudi Arabia. Um, United Arab Emirates is, uh, like I said, it's 80% foreigners, and so when the company, or the country, <laughs> company, that was a weird slip. When the country <laughs> um, opened up to foreign investment, I think that they kind of had to relax several of these laws. Um, and so, no, it's, it's very Western clothing. It's just about being respectful, but it never had to cover my head. Um, I could wear pretty much normal clothing um, in Oman as well. So which older Mercedes, and do you favor DAS mechanical fuel injection or the carburetor? So I have a um, 450 SEL at the moment, 78, and it's the first year of the fuel injector. Um, and I've, it's been a, a great car, and so I, I, I prefer it at the moment because it's been the most reliable. Um, it's the compressor. Um, so I'll show it to you next Thursday. I'll bring it. It's <laughs> pristine. Uh, one more question. Rachel, did you have a question? Yeah. Um, when you travel, I think often as uh, a female, I've gotten a lot of, I would go places and be very unaware, uh, or like I wouldn't see danger and I would go off and, and do things and then other people would be like, you need to be more mindful of your surroundings and, and realize the situations that you're in. So I guess it's kind of a two-part question. Have you and all your travels felt um, unsafe or threatened in a way where you're like, man, I uh, don't know how to handle this situation or I, um, I feel very unsafe in a way where I, um, I don't know where to say this. But if you're going to say, but I don't know how to handle the situation, and or like, what what advice would you give to other females who might feel scared of going to certain places because of the fact that they are female and they might get taken advantage of in certain ways that they don't know they they wouldn't be able to get out of? 
Hmm. Um, thank you for your question. Um, so yes, there have been times when I was um, fearful of the situation and I knew I needed to get out. Um, I actually bribed my way out of Senegal. Um, one time there was a, a bit of a, an internal coup in the country. I had no access to money because the banks were closed. Um, and I was, I stood out like a sore thumb. I was the only white female in the village area. I was living in a village outside of Dakar. And um, there was one flight out a week. And it was like for, anyway, another story another time. But I literally had a bribe with some jewelry that I had on. Um, so in that moment, though, I had to assess the situation. I had to find the person that was most likely to sounds horrible, but take my bribe, you know, that, that was able to, um, to get me out of harm's way. And so since then, though, I always, I think it's about anywhere, though, is to look for your exit. Make sure you know your exits. Make sure you know a way to get out if something does go wrong. Um, but also having the mindset that something might go wrong and being fearful, you're just walking around as prey. You know, people are very good at what they do who they're, they spend their life trying to harm others. Um, it's almost like this like evil sense they have when they can smell when you're afraid. So I feel like having a confidence, you know, um, keep a knife on you at all times, um, that you don't let anybody else take from you. <laughs> and uh, I think it's just about being aware you know, just being aware at all times, but no matter where you are, or what you're doing, always see your exit. And then trust your instinct. That's what I would tell everyone. Trust your instinct. If you have a, like a weird feeling, it's real. And the, and the longer I travel and the older I get, the more, the minute that feeling creeps inside, you know, sometimes you don't want to pay attention to it because you're like, oh, I'm having fun or like, this looks cool. Listen to that and go. Um, so I think it's just about just being aware you know, but don't stop doing it. Just keep going. Yeah. So I want to thank you. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for coming and speaking with us today, Ashley Borders. Um, and I also want to say that, uh, you know, you, as a speaker today, you're part of the ACLA family. And I want you to think of us as 100 older brothers that have your back as you're here in Los Angeles. And thank you to everybody at home. Um, I would say don't be a stranger. Come visit us. It's a warm, welcoming, amazing environment. And if you're really nice, we'll show you our shrunken head. See you next Thursday. <laughs>